Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to our special presentation on how to master the market. Uh, what we're going to try to do today is provide a paradigm on how the market works so that it's easier to understand and so that we'll be able to cut through the fog that emanates from Wall Street on a regular basis. And if you would look at your agenda, we're going to start out with a very broad view of what is going on. We're going to look at basic, basic principles of the forces driving the stock market. In this part, how the market works. We're going to ask two basic questions. One, what causes stock prices to go up and down? And two, what causes bull and bear markets? And then we're going to take those broad principles in the next section and we're going to talk about the application of those principles in how to pick stocks. Once we have the idea on how we want to pick stocks, we have to take that and put it into a system that works, a system that is easy to use. And that's what we're going to talk about here, the vector vest system. And then, of course, we'll take uh, a break for lunch. And we'll come back and we'll talk about probably the single most important section in this whole thing, and that's timing the market. And I say it's the single most important thing because if you don't get timing the market right, you won't get anything right. You don't want to be buying stocks when the market's going down, and you don't want to be selling them when the market's going up. If you listen to CNBC, on a regular basis, all you know is buy, 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 buy. Even when the market is getting killed, the standard question is, what are you buying now? You know, and what you ought to be buying is puts or contra funds or something like that. But we'll talk about that. That's very important. Then we're going to take the information that we have up to that point, uh, particularly timing the market, and we're going to look at the application of that information in situational investing. Situational investing is understanding what the market is doing and taking actions that are consistent with the market direction. Finally, we're going to get down to the nitty gritty and we're going to talk about managing your portfolio. So if you can envision a great big funnel, we're going, to, we're going to keep focusing and focusing and focusing and applying things that we learned earlier. Now, I had the pleasure of seeing so many old friends here this morning uh, that I'm delighted. And I'm delighted that all of you are here. So some of you are going to say, well, you know, I heard this part in a seminar he gave and I heard that part in a talk he gave. And sure, there's nothing new here. But what we have is we have it organized in a way that I, I think will be most helpful to you. Okay, without further ado, Mark, let's move into the first section. I'm going to move along fairly quickly, but I will take questions from time to time. Let's move on. Now, what I said we were going to do, we're going to ask the question, what causes stock prices to go up and down? About 55 years ago, I was taking a course in economics. Here over here, right in Cleveland State University. It was called Fenn College then. And the professor uh, apparently was playing the stock market. And one day he got up and he said, you know, you could read the Wall Street Journal. And every day they have a reason why the market went up or why the market went down. And I've been reading these reasons and reading these reasons, and I still don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> and so the point we're going to make here is you could read all those reasons, but we have to think what is behind those reasons? I read a comment the other day from a guy, and he said, this volatility 
He said the reason for it is simply supply and demand. And he said earnings and dividends have nothing to do with it. And that's the kind of stuff you get. But if you think of whatever happens, whether it's a hurricane in the Gulf, whether it's a dry spell in Australia, whether it's a war in Iraq, the underlying reason for creating that difference in supply and demand is that the individuals who own stocks are always going right to the bottom line. Their reaction is, what is this event going to do to the earnings of the company whose stock I own? It always gets down to that. So the thing that causes earnings to rise is rising earnings. The more money a company makes, the better people like it, and the more, the more it goes up. Now, this issue of rising earnings, incidentally, I'm going to follow the slides in this book very closely. This issue of rising earnings has some, some serious enemies. And the first enemy to rising earnings is inflation. Let's look at the next slide, Mark. What we have here is a slide of the S&P 500, the P-E ratio versus the CPI. That's the Consumer Price Index from 1950 to 2006. The red line is the inflation rate, and the blue line is the P-E ratio. Now, if we start here, right around 1960, and incidentally, that's when I got into the stock market, so everything before that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> but if we start around 1960, we can see that as the inflation rate went up, the P-E ratio went down. And when P-E ratios go down, that generally means that prices are going down. And then when the inflation rate came down, P-E ratios went up. And you can see here a little rise in inflation rates and P-E, the P-E's are heading down, okay? Uh, and, and boy, look at those P-E's back there. I, I mean, look at that inflation rate back there, P-E way down here. I, I can remember 1980 or so. Great, great companies, great stocks at P-E ratios of five and six. But this is the relationship here. I'm going to explain what's going on here a little later on. Okay, let's go to the next slide, Mark. So from that graphic, we can say that rising inflation causes stock prices to go lower. So that's the first enemy of rising earnings because when, when inflation goes up, earnings tend to go down. Earnings may go up, but the real value of those earnings are less. So the next enemy, let's look at the next slide. The next enemy of higher stock prices is higher interest rates. Uh, what we have here is the S&P 500 earnings yield versus the 30-year T-bond interest yield. The interest yield is right here in the red, and the earnings yield is in the blue dark blue or black, whatever it is, it's dark blue. Uh, Mark, let's go to the next slide. If you don't know what earnings yield is, it's defined on this slide. It says earnings yield is equal to 100 times the earnings divided by the price. It's a kissing cousin of dividend yield. We all know what dividend yield is. It's a dividend divided by the price times 100. So if the dividend is a dollar and the price is 20, times 100, we take 100 divided by 20, we got 5%. So if the earnings are $1 per share and the price is 20, we have an earnings yield of 5%. Uh, this is an interesting arrangement of that equation. You could say the earnings yield is equal to 100 divided by the P-E ratio. So if the P-E ratio is 20, the earnings yield is 5%. Let's go back, Mark. Now, what we see here, once again, uh, starting with 1960, we see that if the 
interest yield goes up, the earnings yields go up. And when earnings yields are going up, that means the price is going down. Price of the stocks are going down. So that when the interest yields go down, the earnings yields go down, and that means the price of the stock was going up. Okay? Now, I'm still going to explain this in a few minutes. Notice that here we have very high earnings yield, very low interest yield. What was going on? Let's move forward. Next slide. From that previous slide, we can conclude that rising interest rates cause stock prices to go lower. So let's see if we can summarize all this. Stock prices go up when earnings go up, inflation goes down, and interest rates go down. And ladies and gentlemen, those are the only three things you have to be concerned about. All the events, all the reasons, all the things, all the hype, all the fluff boils down to keeping track of these three things. Earnings, interest rates, and inflation. Anything that happens anywhere ultimately reflects itself in one of these three factors. So you can enjoy yourself reading whatever they want to write or explaining whatever they want to say, but you got to think in these terms. Let's move to the next slide, Mark. If we take, if we remember that one slide on earnings yields and interest yields, if we take that slide and we divide the earnings yield by the interest yield, we get this form of a line. And you can see it drops, 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 and once again, starting around 1960, it sort of levels off, and it hovers above and below one. And so back here in 1950, let's say, somebody wanted the, uh, the investors wanted the earnings yield to be six times the interest yield before they bought stocks. And the reason for that goes all the way back to the crash of 1929. Stocks were considered to be extraordinarily risky. And investors would say, well, if I'm going to buy that stock, they have to be making a whale of a lot of money. In other words, the price earnings rate had to be very, very low, which meant the earnings yield was high. Otherwise, I'm going to buy bonds. Okay? Now, as we came out of the Second World War and into 1950, the economy in the United States started to improve very dramatically. And the stock market started having a, a very good showing, and people became more and more comfortable with buying stocks. And so the earnings yield, the demand for higher earnings yield and interest yield started going down. And it, it's, incidentally, that difference between the earnings yield and the interest yield was called a yield premium. And a lot of the old timers still look at the yield premium, the difference between the earnings yield and the interest yield. And in 1960, it finally reached this range of about one, and now it hovers above and below one. Notice that in 72, 73, and 74, the, the, the ratio went back up. And when we see this ratio above one, it means people are fearful. When we see this ratio below one, like it was here in 1999 and 2000, people are greedy. They just want to pay too much for stocks. They're willing to take a lot of risk. And here again, we're above one. Mark, let's move forward. Now. Where do people put their money? Do they want to put it in the bond market or in the stock market? And what we have here is a saying that says, money goes where money grows. Investors will always put their money where they think it's going to give the greatest rate of return. And if they think they're make, going to make more money in the bond market, they'll put their money in bonds. When they see high interest yields, it's very attractive. When they see low P.E. ratios or high earnings yields, that's attractive. And this little relationship, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the most important relationships we can understand. 
about the market, about how the market works. And what we see here is when earnings yields are low, money will flow from the bond market into the stock market and vice versa. It's like a teeter totter Now, people will buy stocks, as I indicated, when they're greedy. And when they get greedy, the price of the stocks go, go up. And so the earnings yields go down, and they'll go down to a point where bonds become attractive. And so the money, finally, when the prices of the stocks are too high, the stock market will start correcting, and the money will flow into the bond market. So this side, earnings yield reflects greed. This side, interest yield reflects fear. This side, earnings yield reflects a desire for capital appreciation. Interest yield reflects a desire for capital preservation. And what we've seen over the last uh, month or so was a flight from out of the stock market into the bond market. And when they went into the bond market, the prices of bonds went up and the interest yields went down. So this goes on day after day after day. And it's a very, very important relationship. Now, how do we use this thing? We can use this relationship to calculate the value of a stock. If we say that earnings yield equals interest yield on the average, we can then use our little equation for earnings yield that we have here. And if we substitute V value for P, and we do a little bit of uh, algebraic uh, rearrangement, we come out with an equation that says value is equal to 100 times earnings divided by interest yield. Now, don't worry about the math. It's just the idea of the thing that we want to look at here. And what this says, it says, I still have this relationship, this competition going on between earnings and interest rates. Okay, Mark? How do we apply this again? Let's look at an example. We've been using McDonald's as a case study for years and years and years. And what we have here in this example, we say that the value for McDonald's equals 100 times 2.68. That's the earnings estimate out of VectorVest uh, as of uh, August the 10th. That's earnings per share. We're, we're forecasting $2.68. At that time, the interest yield was 5.95. In VectorVest, we use a AAA corporate bond, the long-term AAA corporate bond, as the interest yield. Because when I started doing this back in the late 70s, that was the standard of comparison. Uh, a lot of people moved over to the 30-year bond. The 30-year bond is T-bond is gone. And uh, this AAA corporate interest rate still is a good alternative investment for prudent investors. We do the math and we get a value of $45.04 a share. The closing price on August the 10th was $49.41. Yes, sir? Yes, and the interest yield is in percent. It's 5.95%. Now, this is, this is a great little equation, and it's one that you can use in your everyday thinking about the stock market. I get a lot of calls from people that say, you're an investor, are you not, sir? I say, uh, yeah, half-assed, but I'm an investor. Okay? And they say, you know, we've really got a great opportunity for you. And the first thing I ask is, how much money is this company making? Well, <clears throat> you know, this is only a development company, and they, they, haven't, they haven't started making money yet, but they're going to make a lot of money. I say, look, when they start making money, call me up. <laughs> when this number is zero, what, what's the value? Zero. So you can't think in terms of earnings per share. You've got to be thinking about it the value of intellectual property, book value of capital equipment they have, and things like that. And when the number's negative, you still have to go to book value and some other measures. And if the company pays a dividend, there are companies that pay dividends, 
that don't make any money, then you say, well, I'll place a value based on that dividend. And we do that in VectorVest. Let's move on, Mark. That former relationship missed a couple of important things. Uh, here's a little relationship up here. One of the things that we have to take into account, it's extremely important, is earnings growth rate. The higher a company's earnings growth rate, the more value you put on a stock. And we, we give that the label of G right here, earnings growth rate in percent per year. Now, next to earnings growth rate, we have a term called R. R equals the percent return on total capital. Let me give you a little example. There's company A has $100,000, company B has $100,000. They both invest their money. Company A makes 30%. They make $30,000 at the end of the year on that $100,000 investment. Company B made zero. Company A has an additional $30,000 that they can invest to grow the company. What does company B have? They got nothing. And so the return on total capital really dictates the long-term inherent growth rate of that business or that company. So a company with zero profits, you know, they have to go out and borrow money or something, and if they borrow money, they increase their interest payments and all kinds of problems. So I combined R with G and I take the average of those two, okay? And now these growth rates have to be better, they have to compete with the interest yield and inflation. And this is called what I call a hurdle rate. R plus G has got to be greater than IY plus F if it's a company that I wanna be interested in. So you always wanna think in terms of the interest yield and inflation rate right now they're not much of a problem. You know, inflation rates are two, three percent, and interest rates are uh, four, five, six percent. Back when I started doing this in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, the interest yields were 12, 14 percent, and inflation rates were eight, nine percent. So this was a huge number back in the eight, early 80s, late 70s. Now it's not so bad. Now let's look at the application of this formula. Let's go to the next slide, Mark. Valuation of McDonald's, all right here, I'm not going to run through all the numbers, but I took this data out of VectorVest, and I got a, I got a valuation of $69.51 per share compared to the price that we saw on the earlier slide of $49 for that day. So it says McDonald's is very much undervalued right now, and it's for the reason that gentleman asked. The earnings yields overall are higher than the interest yields, so you get high valuations. Now, this is one speck in the sand. We do millions of these calculations. We've been doing them since 78. Mark, let's look at the next slide. And this is a comparison of the VectorVest Dow Jones Industrial Average, that's the red line, to the actual Dow Jones Industrial Average. And I can spend a lot of time talking about this graph. I can spend all day talking about it. But right now, what we see right now is the value is it's 40% higher than the real Dow. That's because we have high earnings and low inflation rates and low interest rates. Back in 1999, it was just the opposite. We had high price earnings ratios and lower earnings and higher interest and inflation rates. And so here's, here's a gap here that foretold a downturn Here's a gap here that foretells good things for the stock market. Value is a long-term indicator of the direction of the stock market. It's just long-term, okay? Mark, let's look at the next slide. The current situation is that the Dow Jones Industrial Average is undervalued, and here we have the numbers. Let's go to the next slide. This is the market as a whole. You can see the price of the VectorVest composite is below the value. This is all the stocks in the database. We have 8,000 plus stocks in a the database. They have an average average price 
as of the 10th of 2909, the average value was 3259. Let's keep going, Mark. Uh, any questions on what we just completed? Yes, sir. The, the question is, if we're using AAA corporate bonds as a basis of care, comparing everything and doing everything, wouldn't that be a good place to park your money, long-term money? And the answer is absolutely yes. And that's why we use it, because it is the alternative investment. In fact, it may be the primary investment for investors to put their money in AAA corporate bonds, relatively safe, they pay a certain yield. And the question is, should I buy stocks instead of bonds? That gets back to this EYIY thing. And we took that information and converted it to absolute values for the stocks. And so this is what uh, investors are doing all the time. They're saying, should I park my money in AAA corporate bonds or should I buy a stock? And we're going to look at that question in more detail in a few minutes here. One more question. All right, question is, how far above the actual price does the value have to be for the market to be considered under value? Our calculation of value is 10% above the price or more, is 10% higher or more, we say the market's undervalued. When it's 10% below or more, we say the market is overvalued. When, when it's in that band of plus or minus 10%, we say it's fairly valued. Let's move ahead, Mark. All right. What causes bull and bear markets? Bull markets are born when the economy is weak, inflation and interest rates are low, and earnings are expected to rise. A lot of people say the time to buy stocks is when you see blood in the streets and you think the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Okay, Mark, let's jump into VectorVest software. Let's go into views. And let's look at uh, VectorVest views and go, go back to uh, November the 1st, 2002. If you remember that time period, that's essentially where the end of the bear market was. Okay, and let's look at uh, that and go into the climate, investment climate. For the, for the most part, the economic data last week foreshadows a relatively Gloomy outlook. As we have stated, however, it's not the data that counts during a presidential election cycle. It's what the politicians are going to do in regard to creating jobs over the next 14 months. In this regard, everyone is waiting to see what Sir Allen would do next Wednesday. Since the interest yields on 90-day T-bonds has fallen to 1.4%, Sir Allen, you know he was knighted by the Queen of England, has room to move with a quarter point decrease in the federal funds rate to 1.5%. Whether he will do this or not is anyone's guess. Mine is he'll do nothing. He actually lowered the interest rate by 0.5 tenths of a percent and the market took off like a bird. But right in that October, November period, that was the end of the bear market, the beginning of the bull market. And so let's go back to the slides. Bull markets, bull markets are born when everything looks bleak. Let's go to the next slide. Bear markets are born when the economy is strong, inflation and interest rates are high, and earnings are expected to fall. Go to, uh, go to February 18th, 2000, Mark. Remember those good old boom days? Dr. Greenspan has seldom been so explicit. He will keep raising interest rates as long as it takes to cool the economy and the stock market. He did suggest our he prefers to continue with his gradualist approach of raising rates at a quarter of a percent of the time. Okay? So when he said that, stock prices fell. But Greenspan started raising rates in 99, and he kept raising them and raising them and raising them. He eventually killed the economy, but the market peaked on March the 1st, 2000, and was downhill, essentially downhill, steadily all the way to the bottom in October 2002. And so this is the scenarios we got to look at. So where are we right now? We're 
you know, in a bull market right now, we've seen the earnings go up. We've seen the economy was good. Uh, people are talking about, you know, fearful whether Bernanke is gonna, gonna raise interest rates. Of course, the market goes down and we get a credit crunch. Now they want them to lower interest rates, but let's go back to the PowerPoints. Okay, let's go to the next slide. The virtuous vicious cycle. The thing we wanna watch and the thing the Fed watches is inflation rate. Inflation drives interest rates. Interest rates dictate the strength of the economy. I like to think of interest rates like the thermostat you have in a room. Let's say if this room gets too hot, the temperature on that thermostat is going to go up and they have a bimetallic strip in there. And that bimetallic strip is going to move and kick on the air conditioners. So the air conditioners are going to create cool air and bring that temperature back down. So when the economy gets too hot, the Fed raises interest rates. Interest rates cause the cost of business to go up they cause uh, a slowdown in economic activity, and then earnings will start going down. And so the economy will weaken. And when the economy is weak, like we saw when Greenspan lowered interest rates, you know, in November 2002, he lowered interest rates because the room was too cold. So he turned off the air conditioner, he put on the heat, and it raised the temperature. Okay? The economy affects earnings, and earnings ultimately cause stock prices to rise or fall. Mark, let's go to the next slide. The investment climate, VectorVest monitors earnings, inflation, interest rates, market direction, and investor sentiment. We do that every week. Let's go to the next slide. Now, Mark, before we look at this, let's go into the investment climate. Let's just show folks where we have that information. This, this is in VectorVest views, and I uh, use that drop down, and we have all these sections in the views. We have a section on climate. So scroll down here, and we look. We look at all these, all these factors every week, and we have two factors for inflation, three factors for interest rates. We have a, a factor for S&P 500, uh, uh, what year are you in? You, you come to the current time. We years ago we didn't watch earnings. We're, we're watching earnings now very carefully. Okay, we have a factor for the S and P 500 index and the S and P 500 earnings, and this is extremely important. Now, when earnings are going up, this number is above one. When earnings are going down, it's below one. Right now, it's above one. When inflation is going up. This number is below one because inflation is an enemy. If, if inflation is going up, that's bad. Numbers below one are bad. Number one's, uh, numbers uh, above one are good. And we have two indicators of inflation, three indicators of interest rates. Okay? And when we take a look at this, we take a look at the overall composite. But the thing we really watch is the earnings. But we watch all of them. Mark, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Now, we took all this information and we said, what's an easy way to interpret that information? And of course, this doesn't look easy at all. In fact, it looks, it looks pretty, pretty stupid. But let's see what we have. This column E stands for earnings, F stands for inflation, I stands for interest rates, and P stands for prices. And what this says, if earnings are going up, and inflation is going up, and interest rates are going down, prices ought to go up. And, and this kind of a condition will exist at the beginning of a bull market. Then, if we see, if we see a situation in which earnings are going up, inflation's going down, interest rates are going down, prices will go up, and the bull market thrives because we have the best of all worlds. We have earnings going up, inflation and interest rates going down. And they call that the Goldilocks scenario. You have everything. Uh, this one, uh, uh, up, down, up, up. That one rarely happens because you've got, you got inflation going down and interest rates going up. Now, this one here, the case for bull market. And earnings are going up, inflation goes up, interest rates go up, 
and prices go up. This is the one that we've been in for a long time. In case for bull market scenarios, last a long time. And what you're doing here is you're climbing the wall of worry. Because you constantly are looking at the corporate earnings. How are they going up? You're constantly looking for, out for inflation. Is inflation going up? And yeah, it's going up. Well, how fast is it going up? And you're looking at interest rates. Is the Fed going to keep raising interest rates? So you're climbing that wall of worry. All right. And eventually, like I showed you, Greenspan insisted he was going to keep raising interest rates until he cooled the economy down. And when he did, when he did, this started happening. Earnings started going down. And this table is extraordinarily easy to read because every case in which earnings are going up is a bull market and every case in which earnings are going down is a bear market. So that's what we're going to keep our eye on. What are happening to corporate earnings? Go ahead, Mark. All right, the current situation. The U.S. market is in a case for bull market scenario. Earnings, inflation, and interest rates are rising. Go to the next slide. The outlook. The bull market will continue as long as it is perceived that the earnings are rising. It's the perception. Uh, investors look ahead. And what we do is we buy earnings forecasts from Thompson Financial. If we see those earnings forecasts are going down, that number I showed you, that 108 for the S&P 500 is going to start going down. Mark, can we go back in a vector vest? And uh, close the views. And let's look at a uh, climate graph. We graph all that data we get week to week. And what I'd like to have you show, Mark, is show the S&P earnings and show the S&P earnings index and take that other stuff off. Now, we started doing this in 2003, but here's the S&P earnings uh, over this period of time as forecast by VectorVest. And here's this indicator, okay? And by golly, this little indicator is hanging in here, hanging in there uh, between 105 and 108. And I haven't seen this thing start turning. A little dips like that might happen. But I haven't seen this guy fold over yet. And, and my, my feeling is as long as earnings are going up, we're going to be in a bull market. Now, in spite of that, you know, you could have the ups and downs, the normal uh, pullbacks and, and, and rallies in the market. Yeah.